Okay, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, the, our seminar this morning. Uh, my name is uh, Porik Walsh. I'm the Chief Executive of QQI. Just looking down, we have 80 or 90 people already uh, in, so I think we, we, we can make a start. Okay, I'm delighted to welcome you all to this morning's webinar on ePROCTOR. Uh, I'd like to thank the partnerships team in QQI, particularly uh, Sue and Quiva, for the organization of the webinar. Uh, the webinar is based on a piece of research on e-proctoring, which QQI commissioned from Professor Paul Giller earlier in the year. Uh, the topic of remote e-proctoring has become increasingly discussed and explored with the COVID-19 emergency requiring providers to make alternative arrangements at short notice to their traditional in-person assessment practices. When we all had to suddenly pivot to online teaching, learning and assessment, there was considerable initial talk about e-proctoring as if it was a possible silver bullet. As a consequence, we became aware that we needed more information on what's on offer, how it can work, the context in which it can work, and those in which it is maybe less successful. As experience has developed and awareness has grown, perhaps we're now a bit more realistic and Professor Giller's report provides a very comprehensive exploration and analysis of both the literature out there and the experience of providers, both nationally and internationally, to be proctoring. The report will, I hope, support institutions in making choices about e proctoring and, where appropriate, developing fit for purpose e proctoring policies and approaches tailored to their own specific context. I'd like to thank all for the support and to welcome us to present this webinar. I have a personal interest in today's presentation as, like many parents, my house and its occupants acted as a laboratory for the many adjustments to teaching and learning that have occurred over the past 20 months. My younger daughter sat FE1 law examination in October under e conditions, and her experience was somewhat mixed, I would say. So I'd be very interested to hear Paul's research on the wider experience of the technology. Paul's presentation will last for approximately 30 minutes and will be followed by a 20 to 30 minute Q&A session. Please pop your questions into the chat function once it has been opened. Uh, so with no more ado, Paul, over to you, please. Thanks very much. No, I just have to find the right slide. Can you all see that? Good, thanks very much. Well, thank you all for, for joining this webinar. I should point out at the, at the outset, I'm, I'm not a practitioner of e-proctoring, but I'm a, a commentator, as it were. And I've explored the, the quite sizable literature and sought the views of colleagues and institutions on their experiences with e-proctoring in putting together this recently uh, published report. Now, as you can see, from the report contents, it covers a, a lot of ground. And obviously in this short presentation, I can only touch on some of the, the key aspects of the review, but I hope it will give you a flavor of the topic area and of the report. Now I wanted to start just with a bit of context and, and a few definitions, if I may. And what we've all seen over the last few decades is a, a growth in online education. And you can see from the, the Babson survey that some six and a half million USA students have taken at least one online course in 2015-16. And the online education market study projects an overall global market for online education of some $350 billion by 2025. Now, as we all know, this, this steady growth in online teaching and learning rapidly accelerated during the, the COVID 
19 epidemic as an emergency response. And there was a very rapid move of really unprecedented scale from traditional face-to-face classroom-based education to almost total online delivery, including remote examinations. Now, with that came a widespread concern of the lack of academic integrity on the online environment and the possibilities of enhanced opportunities for teaching. This was really underpinned by the massive advances in internet speed, the tracking technology, the growth in in online content, which all opened up an opportunity to essay mills, these unscrupulous companies that charge students for assistance in delivering their assessments and uh, assessments that can actually be difficult to detect. Now, many students also and the literature shows this, believe that it's, it's easier to cheat online in courses that lack the examination monitoring systems. And we can see that here in this graphic, which is uh, based on a survey of self-reports of commercial contract cheating by students. And it's clear that the, uh, the incidence is increasing. Now, based on this kind of data and also on the UNESCO global data of some 200 million students, Newton estimated back in 2018 that at that time, there were approximately 7 million students engaged in paying other people to do work for them, that the so-called contract cheating. And yet, less than 1% of the UK students that actually admitted to contract cheating were were being caught. So the response initially was through maybe law and legislation and several jurisdictions, including Ireland, enacted laws that prohibited the provision of contract cheating. Australia went even further and there's a legal requirement there for HEIs to promote academic integrity and to seek to detect cheating. But it seems that this legal route appears to have proved either ineffective or or it's rarely used. And I guess you can understand why, because even where there's such legislation in place, the contract cheating companies can be based outside of the national jurisdiction and they can be freely accessed from anywhere in the world through the internet. So the adoption then of additional assessment security measures arose and the use of e-proctoring as one of these measures has surged during the coronavirus pandemic. And it results from concern that some students will cheat, as as I've just shown, but also it provides a level of reassurance that e-proctoring can provide to stakeholders in deterring and detecting cheating. And when you look, there are now huge numbers of students sitting e-proctored examinations globally. ProctorU, one of the, the main um, proctor companies in 2020, proctored more than 367,000 exams in Australia alone. Proctorio claims to have proctored over 20 million exams in 2020. And ExamSoft, since its foundation in 1998, has proctored over 75 million exams. And with the technological developments, the sophistication of e-proctoring has increased and it's now a multi-million dollar industry. So what is e-proctoring? Remote, online or e-proctoring is a general term that covers a range of different approaches that basically try to simulate on-site supervised exam conditions in the digital online assessments. And at its simplest, e-proctoring is a form of invigilation, which involves monitoring a a student during um, student behaviour during online examinations by proctors that are at some distance Now, I've given a a more uh, complete definition on page seven of the report. 
The monitoring is usually carried out through the webcam and or the microphone on the student's computer. And it can include monitoring of the screen and of the computer activity. And this picture here shows a proctor's view of a student. And here you've got the, the webcam view of the student. Here in, in uh, some systems, they require a second camera. This one placed behind the student smartphone camera. And here you've got the computer screen being viewed and being recorded. Now there's evidence of a deterrent effect of e-proctoring. And there are clear examples from the literature of students performing better in non-proctored than in proctored examinations. I've just got to two examples here. The, the Daffin and Jones study, which included nearly 1,700 students in Washington State University across psychology courses, showed very clear and unequivocal results. Student scores and the time to complete the exams were significantly lower for proctored than for non-proctored examinations. And similarly, the results of Alessio et al, who were looking at student test scores and the percentage time of the exam used uh, in a medical terminology exam in, in the US. And again, you can see here the data for the proctored exam shows lower average test score and a lower average time used in the exam. And it's suggested by authors that these results are possibly based around cheating in non-proctored exams with the higher scoring, but also taking longer trying to find the answers Now, the expansion of use and its increasing penetration into the higher education sector reflects a number of perceived benefits to both students and the institutions of e-proctoring. And on page 13 and 14 of the reports, I give a, a bit more detail. I just wanted to highlight a few of these uh, benefits here. So for the student, for example, it provides the option to take the test remotely, it also provides the opportunities for the student to sit the exam when they like, potentially 24, 7, 3, 6, 5. It offers an opportunity to sit in a familiar and quiet environment, use the student's personal computer, and that may help concentration and performance and reduce potential stress. And e-proctored exams also are meeting a, a demand, a growing demand in highly competitive professional disciplines such as healthcare for enhanced identity verification, other digital security measures, and to be recognised by students that the exams are fair and secure assessment. And for the HE institution and, and the academic, there's a solution to um, assessing mass uh, massive open online courses and, and for students abroad. It can help provide exam security. It can provide and reinforce academic integrity. Some e-proctoring approaches can scale very efficiently and also provide flexibility where the institution doesn't have to concentrate all the exams in a short period of time. It can potentially reduce the costs of uh, financial and administrative costs of exam hall management and also allow for more efficient exam paper distribution and ease of access for marking. I just want to touch on the, the major e-proctoring system features and, and the technological elements and there's four of each. The system features include authentication where the uh, registered student is authenticated making sure that the student is the one who should be taking the exam the browsing tolerance sets the limit of the student's ability to use their 
computer and access applications. Remote authorizing and control allows the invigilator, the proctor, to start and pause and end the exam and to flag or investigate suspicious student behaviors. And then report generation, creation of reports of the student activities during the proctored exam or following the exam by reviewing recordings. The technological elements include lockdown browsers, which prevent access to the internet and external information, and they can restrict computer use and prevent other functions, and also allow the proctor to view the screen. You have surveillance, the video and auditory surveillance through the webcam, which is providing, I guess, an, an element of normal invigilation. And surveillance can help authenticate the student, can scan the room, scan the desk space, and monitor the student's behavior and activity. Now, these are sometimes helped by biometrics and, and stylometry, where the systems can uh, examine fingerprints, the face, irises, voice, and signature and also keystroke analytics or a combination of these to ensure that the individual is the intended examinee during the examination. And the modern uh, e-proctoring systems uh, are using artificial intelligence, which uh, use search algorithm analysis, and they can automatically detect behaviours or activities on the computer or through the webcam that meet an explicitly defined list of integrity violations that are basically programmed into the system. Now in the report, um, there's this table, table two, which highlights the, the pros and the cons of the various technological uh, approaches to online proctoring. And this slide just highlights the three main e-proctoring approaches. And there's a lot more detail, obviously, in, in the report on pages 17 and 18. But just to highlight a couple of things, human-led live proctoring, this very most closely resembles traditional exam hall invigilation, where the invigilator proctor can remotely monitor behavior but it's got limited scalability. And also it's the highest cost approach, as, as, I'll, as I'll talk about later. Now, alternative is, is recorded proctoring, where the audio camera, either video or stills, and other data are recorded during the exam, and then they're reviewed after the exam. This is much more scalable, and potentially you can have a large number of students able to sit the exams at the same time. And the third approach is the automated artificial intelligence-based proctoring, where these AI bots use advanced video and audio analytics and algorithms to authenticate identity, provide standard instructions, check the room conditions, monitor internet browsing, and observe the test taker. And this offers the most scalable solution is potentially more efficient than the other two in terms of time and cost. Questions arise, of course, of which of these approaches should you use? And Siet says produce a, a very interesting assessment security selection model where he recommends different approaches to e-proctoring dependent on the risk of fraud and the importance of the assessment, the examination. And depending on the risk of fraud or the importance, there's a recommendation for different levels of um, e-proctoring, increasing in complexity and uh, an overview from level one to level three. But it's also worth noting that in this model, with very high importance and very high risk of fraud, the recommendation is actually not to use e-proctoring, but to return to the 
regular exam hall invigilated examinations. This kind of, of model can obviously be modified to suit any individual institution. Now just a little bit about the extent of use of e-proctoring. E and firstly, internationally, there's quite a lot of data available. Um, this graphic shows some of the data from a, a, what's called a quick poll, uh, uh, where there was 312 HEIs, mostly from the US, were, were polled, asking about their use of four different types of, of e-proctoring. And basically, the results showed that about 54% of these institutions were using e-proctoring services for exams. And there was a further 23% that were considering using them. Now, in Australia, slightly less, but by the end of 2019, about a quarter of the Australian universities had trialled online proctoring, although none had implemented it at scale. And similarly, in the, the UK, about half of the HEIs that had responded to a QAA service were using e-proctoring, although again it was mostly small in scale or in development. And India, surprisingly, has the second largest online education market behind the USA. And there was a recent um, article in the Times of India that reported one particular provider had partnered with 117 HEIs in the space of 90 days during the summer of 2020, at the, the height of the uh, COVID rise. Now, if you look nationally in, within Ireland, the take up and extent of use of e-proctoring is quite patchy. Even when there, there were, when there were the constraints placed on teaching and learning during COVID. It basically appears there's greater engagement in the Institutes of Technology and the, the private sectors, and in some cases covering all of their examination. And in the report, I, I highlight um, Limerick Institute of Technology, for example, IT Sligo, and the Dublin Business School, who have all undertaken a lot of development work in e proctoring. Now, in contrast, in the university sector, it seems that most its small-scale pilots have been trialled. In NUIG, UCC, they've piloted a small number of e proctored exams, but with limited success. UCD has undertaken a, a larger scale set of trials. TCD has actually introduced the option for e proctored exams in the School of Medicine and will be using this as a primary method of testing going forward. There's also variable use of e-proctoring in the professional statutory and regulatory bodies, the PSRBs. You see it in, in the USA, for example, in the National Council of Architectural Registration Board. In the UK, a, a survey showed that 16 of the HEI course providers for some of these PRs, PSRBs had been asked to make e-proctoring a requirement for accredited online courses, particularly in areas of law, medicine, veterinary science, actuaries, etc. And in Ireland, a number of the PSRBs are using e-proctoring. Uh, Chartered Accountants Ireland started developments uh, prior to COVID-19, and they're using AI-proctored exams for each of their exam sessions and the Life Insurance Association and the Insurance Institute of Ireland also run online proctored exams. Now, along with the introduction of um, su such uh, e proctoring examinations, practices and policies uh, are being developed. And section five of the report highlights examples of the general practices adopted 
in the testing and delivery of e-proctoring and some of the policies. Now I'll just highlight the important elements here, which include the use of pilot projects, initially small scale, but importantly repeated across different cohorts. Engagement with students is critical during the development and establishment of e-proctoring. And the full scale rail rollout of e-proctoring requires a very significant commitment of staff time and resources. But there's been quite variable levels of policy development supporting e-proctoring nationally and internationally. And it goes from no changes to regulations through minor modifications to the development of specific regulations to cover online and proctored exams. It's, all, it's always useful to, to look at case studies and, and in section six of the report, I've highlighted a number of um, literature and um, interview based uh, case studies from various institutions and they show success but they also show failures in the implementation of e-proctoring and i guess it's th this variability is not surprising because although uh, he institutions have got experience in managing exams in exam halls and they can make appropriate assessments about risks and, and act accordingly it's not uh, so for online proctored exams where the institutions have got yet to build up the same level of experience and you also find that, that different proctor companies can use different methods they use different technologies so the experiences of one institution whether it's positive or negative can not be directly applicable or may not be directly applicable to other institutions and I guess that may explain some of the different outcomes of trials and pilot projects that, that we see. Now for the majority of institutions that try, the, the introduction and ongoing use of e-proctoring is found to be challenging for a variety of reasons. And this graphic shows the reported challenges with e-proctoring from this survey I mentioned earlier of 312 HE institutions and in the majority in the, the USA. More than half of the institutions have reported cost and student privacy concerns as, as a challenge. The concerns about whether any products will work and, and the resources to implement and deploy the products were also raised by a considerable number of institutions. And then the availability of tools, the lack of fam familiarity with the best tools and faculty buy-in were also quite important challenges. Perhaps more importantly, there are a number of key problems that have been identified in the literature and through the case studies that um, I, I highlight and go into quite a bit of detail in section seven of the report. Now these include privacy and, and legal issues, data retention and GDPR issues, student stress and anxiety. Unsurprisingly though, not all students are affected by proctoring in the same way. You get both positive and negative impacts. A definite negative uh, issue is digital poverty and student disadvantage, possible disadvantage to students without access to suitable technology or reliable internet connectivity or with limited uh, level of digital literacy. Gaming of the system is, is growing and the ability to detect fraud is, is fraught with difficulties. The level of staff training to detect exam fraud is, is another factor that I've, I've highlighted. And even if you can uh, detect or uh, ident identify issues that might reflect cheating, 
by the proctor or the proctoring system. It's often challenging to prove it. And there are certainly issues with the artificial intelligence systems, which has raised some concerns where the AI systems can misidentify fraud and, and also uh, cause biases against different kinds of students. And that's led one major uh, proctoring provider to drop artificial intelligence systems completely. There are issues around the reliability of technology, log-on problems arise. And even if you, you can have um, quite high success rates of, of log-on, you know, above 90%, it still means there are students that are, are having trouble. And there are significant difficulties um, in a number of places. And these facial recognition problems have led to potential discrimination as well. And finally, cost, which varies depending on the type of e-proctoring. The simple auto-authentication at the lowest cost, going through to automatic proctoring, and then the highest cost being live proctoring. Now on page 47, uh, table five, I show a selection of the major commercial e-proctoring service providers. And it illustrates the proctoring options that are available, the browser requirements, the main international base as well, usually in the USA or India, although there's a growing number in Europe. But the question is, how do you select the best provider? There are some published reviews that compare system capabilities. And on page 48 of the report, I suggest that institutions might consider a, a range of issues going from ease and flexibility of integration with the VLE through to technical performance, reporting capabilities, security standards, anti-fraud measures, cost. And a common feature of the pilot projects and the initial implementation of e-proctoring is a thorough audit and a procurement exercise. And this can be aided by information and reviews from independent articles, from blogs, from the general media even, but also the use of an evaluation matrix. This is just part of the one that's in the appendix of the report, and it provides a useful tool for an institution to evaluate what provider provides the best systems for uh, its, its own uh, requirements. And again, this could be modified by an institution for its own needs. Now, in section nine of the report, I mention and, and highlight some alternative approaches. Now, this is a big area in its own right, alternative approaches to e-proctoring. And it basically uh, is, is around identifying alternative approaches to the traditional examination assessment. And I, I highlight things like the open book exam, assessment design and question banks, one-to-one -one vivas, varying modes of assessments, honesty statements, randomization testing, um, building tools, personalized authentic or project-based assessments, and even the development of an honour code of ethical behaviour. And finally, the last couple of slides, just to offer some general considerations and, and some possible recommendations. Now, along with the, the growth in online delivery over the last two decades, there's been the introduction and gradual expansion of remote proctoring of online examinations. And this is very understandable because e-proctoring offered a clear and a rational option to largely unplanned and widespread and large scale increase in online delivery and the need for remote online assessment during COVID. But as COVID gradually eases, we hope, and the related restrictions and the reopening of campuses take place, along with the return of in-class teaching, what's the future for remote online assessment 
any proctoring. There's a range of benefits that are clear uh, to e-proctoring when, when it's implemented at an appropriate scale in a planned fashion, targeted at suitable disciplines and types of exams, and with an appropriate level of supports and necessary buy-in. But there's also a range of significant and concerning issues around the process and around the systems of e-proctoring. And basically, an institution has to make decisions about whether to introduce remote online assessment through e-proctoring based on a balance of risks and, and resources. On the one hand, the risk to academic integrity, maintenance of standards and the flexibility of delivery. And on the other hand, risks of litigation through privacy issues, challenges to student well-being, and getting staff buy-in and overcoming technological issues. And in section 10 of the report, I try to summarise a number of points and recommendations that I think are, are worth an institution considering when they're planning to introduce e-proctoring. And a few final thoughts. There's a scarcity of properly constructed scientific trials on the utility and impacts, positive or negative, of e-proctoring solutions. And as Dawson cautions in, in his latest book, marketing claims from commercial e-proctoring vendors that their systems are cheat proof should arouse extreme suspicion. We need much further data on the impact of e-proctoring on student learning and on their experience and on the reliability and validity of the assessments. But I think there's no doubt that e-proctoring has a place in the higher education system and some commentators will suggest it's likely to become a greater part of the educational experience in the post-pandemic HEA landscape. And going forward, I think most commentators would suggest that there's some kind of hybrid approach is likely, balancing the clear needs for maintaining academic integrity in the era of growing online delivery against other important competing concerns in higher education, particularly student learning, student welfare, and the overall student experience. So thank you. Um, and I, I think now there are time for questions. So I'll, I'll hand back to uh, Porig and Billy. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed for that. Um, uh, really great overview, right, of your of your very comprehensive report. Um, the my name is Billy Kelly. Um, I'm the chair of the National Academic uh, Integrity Network, and clearly we have some skin in this game. Uh, in the National Academic Integrity Network was set up just before in, in November 2019, just before the the pivot, and clearly. Uh, the pivot to online teaching and online assessment uh, raised uh, more concerns than before about uh, academic integrity and issues of academic integrity. And clearly, e-proctoring is one potential remedy uh, to addressing right, okay, those concerns about um, academic integrity. But I want to um, uh, go to uh, some of the questions, and unfortunately, we won't probably get to, to each and every one of them. Um, some uh, Oshin Hassan uh, raised the question. Oshin, do you do you want to speak to the question? In short, I'm not sure if you, if you can speak to it, Oshin. Um, Oshin uh, leads the NSTEP um, uh, program, and uh, essentially his question, Paul, was about. Uh, student engagement in the development of e-proctoring solutions and students' perceptions of uh, e-proctoring solutions. It, it, it varies um, from, from what I've seen. What, what's very clear is that 
institutions that engage with students at the very early stages of the implementation, explaining what a proctoring is trying to do, um, getting student inputs into the kind of e proctoring um, that they would be happy with, providing lots and lots of information. And th there are cases um, and, and examples which I've, I've highlighted where an academic has even taken students through the whole process. Th these are things that, that work very well. Um, I think where something is just imposed, that's where problems arise. Thank you, thank you, Paul. Uh, Ashing Reist had had a question, and I, 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 I'm guessing it related to the data you showed where the performance of students in, in a proctored examinations was lower than um, the um, performance in the same test in a non proctored suit, and also time on task was lower in the proctored version. Ashing asks, are there any other reasons that have been explored why performance would differ in non proctored examinations? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the uh, one of the other ob obvious uh, potential issues is uh, student stress of being basically watched on screen by by proctors and that could lead to um, anxiety and, and lower performance but some of these um, some of these studies have been very good in terms of, of an experimental approach with a swapping of cohorts and some randomization, et cetera. And, and they seem to suggest that it's down to a deterrent effect um, of cheating and also reducing the possibility of a number of students cheating, which would lead to a higher average mark. And then the reduced time spent is because it's, it's suggested that students are not spending time on the internet scrolling for and searching for the answers. Yvonne Kavanagh asks a question, and I, I think you sort of answered this already, right, okay, but um, she asks, even with the most sophisticated monitored system and a live e-proctoring system, is it possible to cheat and have <laughs> few examples of that? Yes, and, it is. Um, the, the, there's a, a new book out by, by Philip Dawson, um, which, which has a section Couple, I think it's a whole chapter on on ways in which students can cheat, and and the, a really um, a really interesting and um, very informative report by Sietzes, which goes through different ways um, students can basically gain the system and how you can overcome it. The more sophisticated and more um, intrusive proctoring would. would introduce a second um, camera, for example, behind the student so they can monitor the, um, the student from behind and see what they're doing. But th there's always the possibility and the students with, with great um, technological skills can actually overcome these systems and they can introduce a proxy um, computer kind of in the background that's running and do their exam, but have this other thing running. That, that there's a great ingenuity, and it, it, some um, commentators term it something like an arms race. Um, Dave Otway makes a point, right, again, okay, echoed by others, whether or not it's not better to redesign and improve our assessment methods and the types of questions, right, rather than rely on an e-proctoring solution. Have you come across cases, Paul, where, where institutions took that approach on, on, on a widespread basis? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's a number of examples in, um, in the States where the institution basically decided they would not use e-proctoring at all because of the, the problems, the privacy issues and, and possible discrimination issues. And they've gone down this other route. But it, it requires um, a lot of support and a lot of um, staff development. I mean, some of our own institutions um, 
here, um, LYIT and IT Sligo, for example, have have spent a lot of time and effort in helping staff um, develop skills, for example, in, in managing and designing open book exams. So that that is another way and a better way. But there are types of exams that can be managed well with the proctoring. There are other types of exams that have problems. And it's finding, as I, I suggested, finding the best, uh, finding the, the fit. You know, certain kinds of exams, certain kind of conditions, certain kind of subjects lend themselves well to e proctoring and others do not. Um, and the institution has got to balance out the, these these uh, these risks. Um, you mentioned of IT Sligo there. Um, Gavin Clinch had that very early on made made a key distinction in the chat between uh, remote proctoring and online proctoring. And um, uh, again, uh, online proctoring relying on the critical role of the internet. Um, on a related point, I I would have said. E-proctoring uh, clearly relates to uh, what would have been, for the most part, on-campus examinations. But it is the rise, in some sense, of internet access that is the greatest threat to academic integrity. I always make the point, these risks were here for, for essays and projects long before right, we pivoted uh, to online learning. But is there any consideration, Paul, to uh, accessibility issues in terms of e-proctoring? And we're, we think about, uh, on the positive side, accessibility for, for students who, who, who don't attend campus, but then also the difficulties that it can pre uh, present, for example, for neurodivergent students. Mm. Yeah, it's... It, 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 it is a challenge, and, and it's it's again balancing the, the you know the, um, the the benefits and and the uh, and the and the risks. I mean, what what seems to have happened is that the um, online the the flexibility that online education provides is very powerful, um, and on the other hand, if you want to try and maintain the um, academic integrity, you have to try to manage that in some way. And that's what the e proctoring systems have been trying to do. They can be got round, they, they lead to some um, biases and, and, and problems. And, and this kind of arms race issue I, I raised that the, the proctoring companies are trying to do better and some are making quite important developments um, going forward. But if you tie in proctoring with a better design of examination assessment protocols, you can overcome some of the problems. Um, and, I, and I gave a few examples um, where you, you make the exam a bit more um, dependent on the individual student rather than a, a kind of generic exam question, a more focused question that only that student could provide an answer for. You know, th those kind of ways help and that could allow you to get the best of all worlds, you know, the flexibility of the of the online and the uh, academic integrity at the same time. So I don't know if that answers your your query there, Billy. But. Yeah, I think it goes some, some way. Uh, Michelle McCoy asks uh, a question about, is it difficult to impose a penalty on those suspected of misconduct during the online exam? And I'm guessing, right, okay, the misconduct in a, in a in a an exam hall is generally pretty clear cut, um, whereas online it's much more open to interpretation. Some some commentators would argue that it's actually easier in some ways online, in that you've actually got a video recording, for example, and you've got evidence of the activities from the computer. Um, it's you know what what um, acts were being used and, and what sites were being accessed, uh, but it is a, it is a challenge, um, and and it ha it's a challenge that has to be met through the in, uh, institutional regulations. 
And some have got quite robust regulations that uh, cover academic integrity breaches. Um, you know, in the exam hall, you can miss something and it's your word as an invigilator against the students. And, and you know, some of these sophisticated micro headphones, for example, you know, can't be spotted and can give a student uh, an advantage. Um, again, it's this focusing more on the, the style and type um, of assessment can help in making it harder for students to use the essay meals and get advice elsewhere because of the uh, the nature of the exam that's been set for them. The um, uh, Marion Jennings makes a, a point about uh, the biggest concern for students sometimes in the exam, and she's basing this on a personal experience, uh, was uh, the reliability and stability of, of broadband. Has that arisen commonly as an issue in, in e proctor situations? Yeah, yeah, it, it, it has. Um, it's getting better, I think, but it, it's it's without doubt an issue. Um, in, in Ireland, some of the examples, some of the institutions have, have found very high levels of log on ability, you know, 95, 97 percent. But that still means some students are not getting access. And in those cases, the um, the solution is, pr is to provide an on-campus alternative. So it's the students that have problems getting access in location or with equipment or with broadband can come into the institution and sit in um, a room with a computer provided by the institution. So that, that's one way around it. Some um, examples I've I've come across or, or um, implied that, that some of the proctor companies are expecting log on problems and you just have to then allow the student to retake the exam or you allow the student to go into and carry out the exam not proctored you basically switch off the proctor and you give them access to the exam and you rely on their integrity and their honesty um, ken carroll has asked a question about uh the experience of examiners using proctoring when they have to evaluate these reports generated by the proctoring system? It's down to experience, it appears. Um, it, it, I think what the um, what the introduction of the, the automated systems try to do is to take out some of the, the, the hassle and some of the challenge of, of identifying problems. But they found that those automated systems can identify the wrong things and, and a lot of mis misidentified cases of fraud have, have come up. But there is evidence um, and it's, it's published evidence that training of staff helps and training of staff to identify um, fraudulent um, answers just, just as we, we would normally when you, you get an essay use it, using Tunit, Turnitin, for example, um, for plagiarism, you, you can get experience and be helped in identifying cases of fraud. So it's challenging at the start, but with experience, I think staff get better at it, just as we would when, when we're marking essays and et cetera in, in the normal way. Um, Eamon O'Coffey um, um, uh, tells in the chat of the sort of the scars, right, okay, that he has, right, okay, from remote proctoring, right, and I'm down to 80 students last year, uh, but the work intensity, right, okay, and the criticisms from students about invasiveness and, and, and uh, whatever on that. Um, the, um, I see Judith Gilroy from RCSI, um, uh, is reporting a positive for right, okay, on this right, okay, and sorry, I've actually lost my thread on this. Um, uh, it's interesting. The policies are important, and she says, including supporting diverse students as well as disciplinary regulations. And what they did was they ran mocks with the students in advance, right? So um, yeah, yeah no, that kind of that that approach is is very important. It's this this introduction, the pilot um, 
approach is testing out the systems first and then allowing the students to practice practice getting access to the system logging on and, and mock exams is, is a great way um, of practicing it, it takes away some of the fear i guess of the uh, of the approach related to that paul is there is there any evidence out there the students who have been in uh, e-proctoring environments for a period of time like who would have had a history of this are actually more comfortable with it mm -hmm. yeah there is um i think i think in in discussions with with uh, colleagues in ucd they they kind of in, imply that this was happening because they, they ran a number of cohorts and not only did the staff get more um, get better at, at, at managing it, but students who had already done one knew what to expect. I think the initial implementation, the initial um, exposure is, is the biggest challenge to staff and, and to students, but it's possible to get more comfortable with it. And I think that's generally a, a finding. Uh, Catherine Moore echoes right, uh, Judith's point, right? Okay, in terms of from ACCA, right? They ran similar kinds of things. I'm also struck as, as we close now um, by the experience of students with examinations, uh, certainly in the universities. We've had some issues where students regard a return to on campus examinations as unfair because they haven't had an experience of it. And it's true for <laughs> many students. They <laughs> Uh, even new students joining us right, okay, from the second level system, they haven't had an experience of, of formal examination halls for two years. Yeah, interesting, interesting point. I mean, one, one possible future is exam hall with a computer in front of you rather than pen and paper. Sure. Uh, Paul, uh, thank you very much for this. This could go on for 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 hours, I'm sure. Right, a little <laughs> more questions, but we've reached the end of our uh, end of uh, our time. Thank you very much, right, okay, for the webinar, the insights you've given us. Um, colleagues, I'm sure, right, okay, will go off and 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 read your report if they haven't already in more detail. And thank you very much, right, okay, for 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 this webinar and for your engagement with the questions uh, after it. Thank you indeed. Thank, thanks very much, Billy, and uh, thank you everyone for for joining.